In this episode, let's investigate a carbon dioxide laser with a thermal camera. In a previous episode, I did a review of a thermal camera, mostly because I thought it would be an interesting tool to have in the lab anyway, but also because I envisaged doing some really interesting experiments with it. These are indeed very cool devices and provide a fascinating view of the hidden world of the long wave infrared. Thermal cameras view heat, or more accurately, the long wave infrared wavelengths emitted by hot objects. These cameras generally respond to light in the range of 8 to 14 microns. This is a really important point. What you're seeing with these is very long wavelength light. You literally glow in the dark at these wavelengths. Indeed, everything above zero Kelvin emits some infrared radiation, though for our purposes, we'll be looking at things we consider to be warm or hot within the reference frame of room temperature. If we take a look at this diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see exactly where this light lies, somewhere between the near infrared emitted by your television remote and the microwaves you use to cook your food. Since we are in fact dealing with light, I thought it would be interesting to see if we can view the invisible light emitted from a carbon dioxide laser with a thermal camera. Carbon dioxide lasers are the workhorse of the laser cutting industry and the original orbital death ray. They're still the highest power and most efficient long wave infrared lasers available. These normally emit long wave infrared light at around about 10.6 microns, well outside the range of human vision and indeed digital camera vision, but well within the range of thermal cameras. I have here a SINRAD 48-2 20 watt carbon dioxide laser that I repaired in a previous episode. Unusually, this laser is at a wavelength of 9.3 microns as opposed to the usual 10.6 microns. These are really nice CO2 lasers, compact and air-cooled, ideal for benchtop experiments. With that said, when running such a laser with an open beam on the bench, beam stops are required and safety glasses are an absolute must. Obviously, don't try stuff like this at home if you don't know what you're doing. To control the laser, I'm using a homemade controller. Real SINRAD controllers show up on eBay from time to time, but they're always at ridiculous prices, so I've decided to roll my own. The controller provides the main functions of a proper SINRAD controller, including the 5 kHz tickle pulse and PWM power level control. The design can easily be adapted for other lasers, for example nitrogen lasers and diode lasers, all I need to do is reprogram the controller. If you're interested in this design, please do leave a comment down below. If there's enough interest, I'll do a video on it and release the design. I have the laser mounted on an optical bench. In the beam path, I have a homemade beam stop, and of course, I'm wearing the all-important laser safety glasses. The beam stop is made of a refractory ceramic, the same material used in fire brick, which will not burn or melt. The laser is switched on now, and although nothing appears to be happening, an invisible laser beam of several watts is now shining at the target. If I hold anything in the beam path that is remotely combustible, it will char and burst into flame. Awesome. To have the laser do useful work, it's necessary to focus the beam. Ordinary glass or plastic optics cannot be used here, as they are opaque at these wavelengths. Here I have placed a zinc selenide focusing lens into the beam path. Zinc selenide is used as it is transparent to long wave infrared. If I turn the laser on, the laser beam rapidly raises the ceramic to incandescence. The temperature here is likely well in excess of 1000 degrees Celsius. There is little point trying to measure the temperature of the spot with a thermal camera as it is only rated to 550 degrees Celsius. I've positioned the thermal camera behind the target looking towards the CO2 laser. The beam is still invisible as air is quite transparent at these wavelengths. If I blow smoke in the beam path, however, we can actually see the beam. This is fantastic. Let's try this with a different color map. We'll use the hot color map. Awesome. I have a freeze frame here and we can see that temperature points have appeared along the beam path. It is not likely that this is the actual temperature of the air at these points. The infrared light is being scattered off of the smoke particles. With an ordinary warm object, temperature is derived from the amount of long wave infrared being emitted by it. This is a special case where long wave infrared is intense enough to be detected being scattered by smoke. The software just doesn't know the difference. Since we're looking at lasers, let's see if we can resolve a diffraction pattern with the thermal camera. 
With visible laser light this is very easy, simply pass a laser beam through a single slit and the diffraction pattern can be clearly seen. In order to see the diffraction pattern of a carbon dioxide laser, I have the CO2 laser set up here. For the target, I have a very large round refractory disc and in the beam path, I've mounted an adjustable slit. I'm going to run the laser at the lowest possible power to avoid saturating or damaging the thermal camera. In the thermal camera view, we can clearly see the large target plate and here is the adjustable slit mounted in front of the CO2 laser. Initially, the slit is wide open and if I turn the laser on, you can see a single spot on the plate. As I reduce the width of the slit, we reach a point where the spot splits into a row of small spots, the diffraction pattern. Let's see that using the hot color map. This is very, very cool. Not as crisp as you might see with ordinary light, but the sensor resolution is really quite low. I was experimenting with focusing the carbon dioxide laser beam down to a point to see if it was possible to detect the local heating of air. In this clip, you can see that due to misaligned optics, a reflection has scattered off of the lens mount and registers over 200 degrees on the camera. You can also quite clearly see diffraction pattern as well. Mistakes like this are why you should always wear laser safety glasses when working with lasers. Unfortunately, the camera was not so lucky and you can clearly see a dead pixel here. Interestingly, after some considerable time, the dead pixel has faded and is now barely visible. It is possible that the self-calibration has dealt with it in some sensible way, or perhaps it's an intrinsic property of the sensor material. It is worth saying though, that you shouldn't point these things at high temperature sources such as welders, furnaces, or the sun. High temperature sources, especially point sources, may cause irreversible damage. With that all said, these experiments demonstrate that this little device has potential for some really interesting experiments that go far beyond casually finding heat sources. Perhaps with a little imaginative engineering, it may be possible to build a long wave infrared spectrometer or maybe image objects by reflection rather than emission using a long wave infrared light source. If you have any suggestions that I've not considered, please do leave them in the comments section. That's it for this episode. As always, a huge thank you to my awesome Patreons, channel supporters and subscribers. Your support is what makes science and engineering videos like this possible.